So, hello, Ray. And uh, the first question I wanted to ask you is how uh, did you first came uh, across scenes? Well, we've been talking about this. I guess it, it depends how you determine what a zine is, of course. <laughs> but the first, you know, in, ter in terms of today's idea of what a zine is, I would say uh, the first time uh, was at a little bookshop in uh, Camden Town in London um, called, what was the name of that store? Anyway, it was a shop that, that uh, uh, where you could buy any of the um, the punk scenes, and there were there must have been hundreds of them. I mean, there were just so many of them, and they had a policy: they would take anybody's zine, um, and they had this huge selection of punk scenes. And then, because it was also a, a, a shop that had a lot of op, uh, art material, art magazines especially, um, artists uh, had seen all these scenes. And there were a, num a number of artists who were starting to produce scenes already at the same time and were selling them in the same shop. Um, so that's the first time where I became aware of it really as a, as a thing, you know, as a, as a kind of format, black and white. Uh, um, I think those ones were mostly photocopied. And I was also saying earlier that photocopy in its current form um, it really arrived around 1976, 77, that's when it started. Before that it was a heat s system and, and the type would tend to fade over time, well, faded very quickly over time. And uh, with the new technology of the dry, uh, well, of the plain, what they called the plain paper photocopier, it was possible to make these cheap uh, zines and that's why there was this sudden explosion of them at that time. And uh, so the first one the, were, were photocopied, and um, so do you think that zines have to be photocopied? Well, again, it's what we were talking about <laughs> earlier. There was another technology at the time, um, which in Canada we called quick copy. I'm not sure what it was called in, say, in England or in the U.S. And it was like, a, it was like offset. It was halfway between offset and mimeograph. It was offset, but it was made with a paper plate instead of a metal plate. So you could maybe make 300 copies of something uh, before the plate was destroyed. Um, and I, I suspect that a lot of the uh, punk scenes were actually made using that method. Mm -hmm. um, but there's really no way to know when you look at it. The quick paper print, the quick, uh, quick copy and photocopy really look identical. This is, I can't tell them apart. Um, because maybe it was even cheaper than photocopies. At this well, time. if you were going to do over a hundred copies, mm. then it was cheaper, much cheaper than photocopy. Mm. Um, so it depends. If somebody was going to do ten copies, that's one thing. But if you're going to do one hundred and fifty copies, that's another. Mm. Uh, and so the the form of the zines were uh, always um, a consequence of the technique. That yes, was used. I think so. And also with photocopy, of course. Uh, it, it's natural to use an A4 or, or even have by 11 in North America and fold it and that automatically gives you the kind of standard size mm -hmm. for a zine. And um, with the quick copy, um, I think it was the same. I think it was designed, the machine was designed for, uh, for small sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was standard size, uh, yeah. just like photocopy. Yes, yeah, so when you went into this little bookstore, and the other thing was that it was at that moment when everything was really black and white. So you went into the store, everything was black text on a white background. You know, there was, no, there was just a, a sea of little zines on a, a standing face out. Um, and uh, they, were all, they were all, in a, in a way, identical, you know, mm. more collage -y or whatever, but, but still black on white paper. Mm. So, so what could we find there? Punk zines mostly? There were uh, probably every punk zine being produced in London at the time. Mm -hmm. and there were really a lot of them. Really mm. a lot of them. Yeah. Every band had its little zine. Yeah. And then there were... I'm trying to remember who the artists were who were doing zines. Well, there was, of course, there was... Um, 
Stephen Willits? Yes, uh, Stephen Willits uh, had some zine. I mean, he played with the format a bit more. That he mm -hmm. varied the size a bit more. He might use colored, like gray paper instead of white paper or whatever. But essentially, he was producing zines at that time. In, in addition to his magazine control, mm -hmm. um, and those were available there, and then there were and there were a number of other kind of conceptual British artists, and I'm the worst person to remember names. I'll probably remember the names immediately after you leave. <laughs> um, but there were there were there were you know there was a little section of art zines, mm. but of course we weren't calling them zines yet. So it was just like... What were they called then? They weren't called anything, they were just <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> they existed. <laughs> Not even publications? Or... I guess we would just call them publications, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, mm -hmm. like uh, Stephen Willits, we would have referred to them. When we first um, began selling Stephen Willits, which is already by... 76, I think, I think we just referred to them as pamphlets, mm, yes. because it, mm. they also come out of the tradition of pamphleteering. Mm. Um, which is very strong and very yeah, old. Yeah, which is mm. very, very old and very interesting history. Mm. Um, so I think we just called them pamphlets. Um, and so when did you start uh, selling them uh, uh, in Canada? Well, in 74, 1974, uh, General Idea set up Art Metropole in Toronto as mm -hmm. a kind of distribution center and archive for artist publications. And we already had quite a lot of things right at the beginning. There were also some like Gilbert and George little pamphlets mm -hmm. um, that, you know, they that the concept of a zine wasn't there, but they were really pretty much a scene. Mm. Um, going back through my memory banks, trying to remember all the things. I should look back through the old catalogs at Art Metropole. Mm. Um, and then when you think about a lot of the early Fluxus publications, mm. there, there's a lot of little pamphlets. Um, yeah. And in the way, you know, that segues into zines. There's, there's mm. definitely a... Like the... Uh, Great Bear pamphlets, for, for example? Yes, Great Bear would be an example, yeah. But there's also uh, ones that are not serial um, uh, pamphlets by um, uh, Yoko Ono or um, um, who else? Well, there was a publisher in London, in uh, Britain, outside of London, they called. Bojas Press, mm. run by David Mayer, and Bojas Press produced a lot of artists' publications, and and you know probably about a third of them were in the pamphlet-like format. Um, and they published Schmuck magazine, and I remember sometimes Schmuck would have a, a pamphlet by an artist inserted inside it. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I, 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 you probably wouldn't think of those as zines, but they're 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 very close forerunner. Mm. I usually um, uh, define zine as having a, a relation to a, a, a subculture, um, which this kind of pamphlets do not necessarily have. I think they no, only to an artist. Yeah, mm, they they refer more to the tradition of. Uh, uh, but then, for example, um, Tom Sachs's zines, mm -hmm. they don't seem to me to have anything to do with the subculture. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're all about Tom Sachs. Yes, but there's some uh, something very punk in the layout and how he makes them with a Yeah, but that's, uh, style. And... that's a style, yeah. And, and he's not part of the punk scene, you know. He's no, not, it's it's just a he's just a, taken the styling, mm. the punk styling. And uh, and so when did, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. When did you start uh, working uh, at uh, Print and Matter? Oh, much later. Um, in 
I went on to the board of Printed Matter in the late 90s, and I began okay. as the director in 2004. Okay. And, uh, and at this point, zines were already everywhere at Printed Matter? Um, well, actually, it was a, that's an interesting question. So that's 30 years after mm -hmm. I was working at Art Metropole. Mm. Um, I remember when I first arrived, uh, Max, uh, Max, you know, who's now the director, mm -hmm. Max saying to me, oh, you know, there's all these young people would like to sell their zines, but in the past we've never accepted zines because mm -hmm. they didn't quite seem to fit the definition of an artist's book. And uh, so, uh, so we changed the rules at that point. We accepted zines. Mm -hmm. And once we were selling zines, um, it changed the dynamic of who came into the shop. And it also changed the dynamic of our events because we started doing uh, launches for, zine, for zines. And so we had events, zine-related events, and then a completely new generation of people started coming through the store. And it, uh, it was um, uh, clearly a very good thing, you know. It was really, uh, it, was, it was becoming kind of a dead, it kind of uh, wasn't involved with the, you know, the kind of living, breathing mm -hmm. stuff of what new young artists are doing right now. Mm -hmm. you know? and that changed everything. And so then Print and Matter started seeing zines as, a, as artist publications. Yes, yeah. I mean, there had to be some relationship to the art world, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that we did, there were some there before, but they had to be very clearly artist publication. I mean, like the Great Bear pamphlets we sold, mm -hmm. but uh, it had to be um, very clearly uh, an artist's publication within the old guidelines, you know, the guidelines that were established in the 70s when Printed Matter was first opened. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, so before that they wouldn't accept uh, zines because they were mostly uh, uh, punk zines and um, yeah, they weren't art. clearly they weren't clearly artwork. They they, they weren't art. related to art, but more to music or to or what, the, whatever. Yeah, but or you know, in the case of the queer zines, it might be more related to sex. You know, <laughs> so, or sex. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think one of the one of the things was that uh, I mean there was all these rules that printed matter had from the seventies, and one of them was that the edition had to be larger than 100 copies. Mm. And very often zines, you know, they produce them as they need them, they copy them, they need some more, they copy, photocopy some more. Mm. So they wouldn't even know what the edition size was. And they say, well, I've just printed 20 so far, but if they sell, I'll print more. Mm. And, and uh, printed matter wouldn't allow that originally. It had to be, there had to, exi there had to be 100 in existence before you could sell them there. And of course, that's completely different now because of books on demand. And now they added a, a box that you can check on the submission application if it's an open <laughs> edition. <Right. laughs> because it still says that you have to have a, a hundred of them, oh, yeah, yeah. but there's this box if it's an, an open edition. Right. And, uh, yeah. So all these uh, zines uh, that are featured in, um, in queer zines, most of them were never sold in at a printed matter. No, no, most of them were not. No, but then you know, in two thousand and six, we began the New York Art Book Fair, and um, it was Max's idea, because he was the one who was really bringing these young people into the store. He had this idea to set up a section of the fair called Friendly Fire, and it was it would be free. All the tables would be free in that section. Um, and uh, but it would be kind of curated. Max chose the people who would get the free tables, and he was looking for people mostly doing zines or politically um, things with kind of political edge to them in a very open kind of definition. Um, and that turned out to be the most exciting part of the fair. That was really incredible when that started. Um, and that gave us the opportunity to to show really an enormous amount of stuff that we couldn't, we didn't have the space to show in the store. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of, you no, know, the majority of printed matters activity with zines 
has really been at the book fairs, first the New York Art Book Fair and then later the LA Art Book Fair. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the LA Art Book Fair, when we first did it in 2013, we had, must have been 5,000 square feet devoted only, only to zines. Wow. Um, I'm like a huge, huge, mm -hmm. we called it Zine World, I think it was a whole building. Um, and that again completely changed um, the dynamics of the fair and also printed matters audience because mm -hmm. people see the fair as a, as a kind of it's a kind of picture of what printed matters about I think mm -hmm. the fair and so the 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 uh, zine the zines have been very important. We also got quite early um, there was a lot of well early two thousand and or 2005, there was a lot of interest in the kind of skateboarder cult culture. And the, and the number of zines, obviously by Mark Gonzalez, but many other people, number of zines coming out of that culture. And so uh, printed matter, or I guess I made a little bit of a project of trying to collect that material together. Um, and uh, we also um, uh, sold and produced some skateboards at the same time that seemed to uh, interact with that. And I, I remember at the Miami Art, uh, Art Basel Miami Beach in 2005, maybe, four, four or five, um, we did a stand which was based, uh, which focused really on the skateboards and then on all the zines, the, skate, the, the zine culture. And, uh, and so, how do you see the, the evolution of zines in the in the year, in the two thousands? Because it's something that is something that existed before because of the photocopy, but now that uh, there is internet and uh, there is a comeback of zines, uh, which is uh, mm -hmm. hard to explain. And, uh, well, I, I always think a zine is a bit like a Tumblr blog, mm -hmm. and in fact, most of the people who produce zines also have Tumblr blogs. <laughs> It's very similar. It's this very similar mentality to the two, and it's nice to have this object that you can keep. Mm. Uh, that, whereas the Tumblr blog itself, you know, will disappear at some point, mm. and it's more ephemeral. I, I don't know. I, I I I think it's very interesting that the internet has set off an explosion of print publishing. Um, and you know, Marshall McLuhan said that when uh, when a technology is dead and the artists take it over. So when, while, while the major uh, publishing companies are having trouble selling books, uh, the artists are having no trouble at all. You know, it's an explosion of, of book publishing and zine publishing. And uh, so I think uh, Marshall McLuhan is right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I wanted to ask you a, a question about uh, uh, the Queer Zines uh, book and uh, uh, how how did you choose the, the zines that are featured in, in, in it? Oh, it was, well, it's gone through several, you know, because there's two editions. It's the first mm -hmm. edition and the second edition. And the second edition is, is uh, uh, being expanded a lot. And, and there's some, in the second edition, there's quite a few zines that we excluded from the first edition, and then as time passed, we thought that was a mistake, those should, those should be in. So, um, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of titles, of course, of queer zines. And um, what we had to start from was Phil Aaron's collection, because it was so uh, comprehensive. And then also uh, my collection, which is uh, smaller, but maybe went back, early, uh, went back further historically. Um, and it was Phil and me, there was a little group of us would get together and actually physically look at the zines. Say, should we include this? Should we not? Um, and so it was a very loose process. There was mm -hmm. no, there were no defined criteria. It was more, this feels like something that should be in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so does the book give a definition by example? Or? I guess. I mean, we stretched the definition a lot. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things in there that you probably wouldn't think of as a zine. Um, 
I mean, the what we were interested in was uh, something that rep represented the, the, the viewpoint or the vision of a particular person or group of people, like a band, I guess, could be a group of people. And, um, and that, um, and the fact that, that these people saw themselves in a way as outsiders, that they, they, they didn't fit into the mainstream mm -hmm. culture, and that they, uh, they didn't, in the ca case of the queer zines, they didn't fit in mainstream gay culture. And they needed to reach each other. They needed this this other way of communicating and sharing. Um, so that was kind of our basic uh, beginning. Um, and I guess we chose um, Straight to Hell was a little. It, it looks like a zine, but again, it was it was printed for sure. It was printed using quick copy, and maybe the early issues are even offset. Um, uh, but that's a, a kind of hard, hardcore little uh, uh, sex magazine that I first saw in a sex shop in Times Square. And what was peculiar about it was the language, was the language of the guy, Malcolm Boyd, who put it together. Um, and he would have little, you know, scathing remarks about the politicians of the day and things like this. Um, uh, so it, it was a kind of activist voice, and it was a voice um, that wanted to allow for sex in all its variant forms, uh, whereas um, gay liberation was, uh, was narrowing uh, the range of what was considered acceptable behavior versus unacceptable behavior. Um, so we started with that. And I don't think you would call it a zine, <laughs> but it was the it was the kind of the foundation of everything for us that came afterwards. And you can go back further with the queer zines. You can go back to one, for example, which was a very early publication that came out of Los Angeles um, and at the at the same uh, really from the Mattachine Society. So that's like I don't know what date the first issue is, but it's probably late fifties or early sixties. There's a long, long history of little gay publications, um, tiny little stapled mm -hmm. things, and they're not really zines. A lot of them I would think of as like somebody trying to do a commercial product, but kind of out of their home. Um, and but at a certain point, you can feel this individual voice come through, and we ch we chose. Boyd McDonald's publications has been the first clear example of that. Yeah, so it's, a, a, it's a, I was about to say, a creative voice because there, yeah, there's exactly. a creative aspect that, it, that yeah. is uh, needed because um, there's, also, uh, there's something that is, uh, I think, quite different uh, from uh, Zins, which is all the uh, free press, and, and but those weren't uh, an individual voice. Those, no. those were collective voices. Uh, how, mm -hmm. how do you um, uh, characterize the difference between a free press and, and zines? Well, I, I haven't actually heard the term free press before. Oh, it's maybe French people who use this. I think it's a French, it's a French <laughs> But you term. see what I what Yes, I, mean. I completely understand mm -hmm. what you mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is, uh, this is what I, would, I call pamphleteering. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually a political content. Is that what you mm -hmm. mean? They're usually uh, no, content. but I'm thinking also about the uh, hippie magazines and these kind of things. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Underground papers. And um, so underground on. papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Free press, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Remember my French, <laughs> <laughs> which is very French. Free press. <laughs> um, well, that you know, I I was I was part of a commune that produced an underground newspaper in the '60s, mm -hmm. and. Um, and we were part of a, a kind of network of underground newspapers uh, in the Western world, you know. So we were, we were always receiving hundreds of papers every week from, you know, from Paris and London and LA, and New York, and so on. And I would say that it's um, that is that's a, a a collective voice, and it's a voice uh, which is trying to um, idealize the future in a way, to kind of create a picture of what. The future should be and what it could be and how can we break away from the past so it's a uh, it's um it has a kind of um uh, goal in a way 
to change society. Mm -hmm. Whereas the zines, when they start to appear, are more just representing what is, mm -hmm. rather than trying to um, create something new. They're, in a way, defending what is. That we have the right to be the way we are, and this is, this is how we are, this is who we are. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the underground papers were more political, when the zines were more uh, activist. I um, don't know whether they were activists exactly. Yeah, but the underground papers, I would call political. I mean, even when they were filled with, I mean, Rolling Stone, I guess, probably when it first started, was a kind of, was a kind of um, um, underground newspaper, but um, there was this idea of, of um, uh, you know, a, a, new, a new time, a new culture, and it's kind of interesting in a way, you know, we still are in that culture that began in the 60s, you know, music today and music in the 60s is, is still relates, whereas music from the 60s and music from the 40s, say, does not relate, mm. or it relates in a very, um, something happened in the 60s. But I, I don't know, I don't, I think often you have to look at these things on a, a on a, on a single basis, you have to look at the mm. zine and say, you know, is that a zine? Mm. I mean, sometimes it's not, I don't know, Wittgenstein talked about family resemblances, how in a family there's no one characteristic that joins them. You know, that you have the same nose as, as, as your father, but you have the smile of your mother. And you can't say that you can determine this family by what they look like, you know, that they all have the same eyes or something like this. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and family resemblances are like a kind of cluster of resemblances. And, and I think that zines are like that. There's this kind of cluster of resemblances, but you, it's very hard to pin down exactly what it is that makes them a zine. Mm 